So I was debating on whether or not I was going to talk about this movie because Kung Fu Panda 4 comes out in a week as of the time I'm recording. But I gotta tell you guys, if, if you've got the words Kung Fu and, and Panda in, in the same title of your movie, well, you're looking at a video essay that's like at least an hour long, and you'd be surprised how little spare time you have when you're a full-time college student. Probably not really, to be honest. And as excited as I am to finally watch a movie from one of my top three favorite film franchises ever on the big screen for the first time, I'm more fascinated by the existence of this movie, since it's very much an outlier in that regard, as well as the admittedly understandable backlash. Because bad DreamWorks TV shows are not a new phenomenon, and they quite frankly don't usually garner this much attention or discourse. And yes, even though this is a feature-length film, I'm including Megamind versus the Doom Syndicate in this category since it's meant to be a pilot that leads into the eventual TV show. I do think that it is important to give a bit of context on this topic to explain why I think that's the case before really getting into why this movie is... bad. <laughs> It's important to note that despite DreamWorks television animation being around since the late 90s, they didn't end up producing their first TV show based on one of their franchises until 2008 with the Penguins of Madagascar show, shortly after the second movie made over $600 million at the box office. That's the main distinction to be made with the present. Financial success was the thing that influenced what DreamWorks IPs got expanded. We didn't get that much spin-off content from a lot of the standalone DreamWorks movies in the 2000s like Flushed Away, Over the Hedge, Be a Movie, Shark Tale, which we can all collectively agree is a crime against humanity. But this general rule of thumb changed around 2013, when the studio partnered with Netflix and announced their first ever collaborative animated series, Turbo Fast, which was actually in development and announced before the movie had even come out. In the words of Jeffrey Katzenberg, Netflix boasts one of the largest and fastest growing audiences in kids' television. They pioneered a new model for TV dramas with House of Cards, and now together, we're doing the same thing with kids' programming. DreamWorks is thrilled to be part of the television revolution. This was an effective business strategy not just because Netflix was the largest and most prominent streaming service at the time, but also having over 2 billion hours worth of children's content in the previous year. I couldn't find any analytics or data with regards to how popular this show was, but it's reasonable to assume that it worked well enough for DreamWorks to decide, let's keep going. From then on, every DreamWorks movie that came out got some kind of spin-off content on Netflix. Except for Kung Fu Panda, Legends of Awesomeness was still airing at the time, and its successor show Pause of Destiny was an Amazon Prime original. Everything else has at least one season of spin-off television, regardless of the financial or critical reception of the original movie. But things really started to solidify themselves once Pacific Data Images, or PDI, the visual effects company DreamWorks worked with, was shut down in 2015 after the poor box office performances of two of the three DreamWorks films that came out the previous year, and was bought by NBC Universal in 2016. They had no real intention of stopping, quite frankly the opposite. When talking about Chris Melendandry's plans for the studio moving forward, CEO Steve Burke said he wanted to, quote, take a lot of the existing DreamWorks franchises and add value as you create new franchises. I can only assume that part of Melendandry's mindset at the time was that he presumed DreamWorks' financial situation was proof that they were incapable of staying afloat on their original ideas, and that franchises should take precedence both with ongoing ones and new projects always being made with them in mind. Ironically, just like the other studio that he's running. And credit where credit is due, I do think Chris Melendandry is the most tolerable of the mainline animation CEOs. Like, I'm not going to do any revisionist history for Illumination because of it, but like, at least he's somewhat ethical, and I do respect that. Now, I've thrown a lot of shade at this era of DreamWorks in past videos, but that's not really why I'm bringing all this up here. Because with the volume of sequels and direct-to-video spin-off content, including 15 seasons of television for Trolls in the eight years since its release, it gave me an understanding of why nobody really brings this sort of thing up when talking about DreamWorks. You don't really see many people complaining about how cash-grabby spin-off content is ruining the studio to the same 
same extent people do for studios like Illumination and Walt Disney Animation Studios, despite the amount of it alone arguably making them worse. Just last year, there was a new Kung Fu Panda show that looked to be on the same level of quality as this new Megamind movie, and there wasn't nearly as much discussion with it. The reason that's the case, though, isn't the quantity of the content, nor is it the quality, it's the success. It's comparatively easier to be concerned at a bad movie that makes over a billion dollars at the box office because that's what often informs a studio's mainstream output. In a way, we treat the seemingly endless side content from DreamWorks the same way we did with Disney direct video sequels, a practice that we all collectively accept and just casually let exist amidst acknowledging the general subpar storytelling and animation quality compared to the original. Well, mostly there's always one or two exceptions. It's a subgenre of content that simply doesn't have enough prevalence in the industry for people to get frustrated about, at least not in relation to the studio's primary body of work. And if you want more insight on what I mean by this, check out the video I did on Pixar a few months ago. So what was it about Megaminds versus the Doom Syndicate that was different? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. Despite now being considered to be one of DreamWorks' all-time best by a lot of media critics, Megamind is very much a cult classic, in the sense that its endurance in online film communities contrasts the financial and critical reception that was relatively lukewarm by the studio standards upon its release. That information is important when talking about this sequel. The noteworthy thing about DreamWorks' general approach towards spin-off content, even before Universal acquired them, is the time it takes for it to come out in relation to the original movie. Before this sequel was announced, the only spin-off content that we had gotten from the movie was a single short titled Megamind and the Button of Doom, which was released as a bonus feature with the DVD in 2011. Meaning this movie and series combo is the first new bit of content we've gotten in over 13 years. It's interesting since there initially wasn't any plans to give this film any form of expansion into a franchise until recently. In fact, you could very much argue this movie was directly responsible for Katzenberg's decision to prioritize their pre-established franchises. All this information is significant to answering the quintessential question I've been asking myself since the moment this trailer came out. Who is this for? As expected, it's a show that's very heavily marketed towards the younger demographic, which isn't a bad thing by itself. I do recognize that there will be different goals in terms of the type of story it wants to tell. But going back to the time gap, Megamind is a great movie. I don't think I really need to sell you on that. But it's also not an iconic one, and the reason for that is relevant to this discussion. Even though I think Megamind is a film that can be enjoyed by anyone regardless of age, it's also a film that I think you'll get the most out of as an adult. Not saying it's an explicitly adult movie, it still very much has a goofy tone and plenty of fantastical elements like a talking fish or cool gadgets and superpowers on display that kids will get a ton out of. But there is something very unique about this DreamWorks movie in particular, having a lot of themes and ideas is much more relevant to an older audience, all the way down to simply the fact that it's a parody of the superhero genre. Since parody is defined as comedic imitation of previous works, having a frame of reference for what's being subverted and or made fun of is the most effective metric for judging this aspect of the film and how it handles certain tropes and concepts, whether it be from a comedic or emotional standpoint. And even on its own merits, there's a much more mature set of thematic ideas. I do think that the central journey of a character transitioning from a villain to a hero is one that kids can understand and learn a lot from. At the same time, there's also more complex subtopics like addressing the toxic nature of misogyny through its primary antagonist or the ambiguous nature of Metro Man's decision to walk away from the hero's life. Not to mention Megamind's journey reflecting the way individuals and society at large can influence the person we actively decide to be. These messages were always there, but they probably weren't the things that you latched onto when watching this movie as a kid. You just probably thought it was funny to watch this big, blue-headed alien kick ass. In a way, it's very similar to how I feel about films like The Incredibles, films that you've always loved but connect with for different reasons depending where you are in life. Part of the reason why I think Megamind is continuing to grow in popularity is the fact that the kids who grew up with it are at an age where the themes and narratives speak louder volumes. But a combination of the way it was marketed and I make bad 
looks so good. And coming out in 2010, one of the best, but also most crowded years for animation, it more or less just silently blended in amongst everything else around it, and it was enough that the higher-ups ceased to make any future content involving this character and his world. So what I'm trying to get at here is that there needs to be a clear incentive for the people who are much older now to watch this movie after a decade of nothing, and this movie doesn't offer up that much in that regard. DreamWorks is normally pretty smart with releasing TV specials and series in close proximity to the target age group so kids can have more of their favorite characters while they still find gross out humor funny. So with Megamind vs. the Doom Syndicate, opting to go backwards in terms of tone, maturity, and animation quality, what reason is there for fans of the original to watch this? And the kids that DreamWorks is very much trying to appeal to with this sequel? That doesn't work either. The time gap matters in this specific case because of how unpopular it is. Megamind doesn't have the same significance to DreamWorks' brand in the same vein as characters like Shrek, which is why people didn't mind when it got a sequel almost 11 years later. Even then, Puss in Boots The Last Wish was set to be released earlier, and the distance between it and the original movie was due to it being in development hell for a long time, but this just feels... desperate? Then, we get to how the time gap negatively impacts the movie in-universe, as it's only been two days since the first film's events. You know how The Incredibles ends on a semi to be continued with the Underminer fight, but still has conclusivity now that they get to fight as a family now? That is justification for a shorter in-universe time gap between movies spread that far apart. This is not. 14 years later, and Megamind is still just getting started as a superhero, and not a very good one. We'll come back to that later, though. There's also the fact that there's way more internet-related humor in this movie, and it makes the small amount of time that's passed feel way less believable. Megamind did have high-tech gadgets, but that was something more or less unique to him. If we are going to assume that this movie takes place in the modern day, then there's no way that society would be this influencer-heavy in 2010. The same thing applies to the contrasting tones. It feels off given the nature of the first film. And this right here is part of the reason why I don't mind when DreamWorks pulls this kind of thing for franchises like Trolls and Boss Baby. Because there's basically no distinction in terms of what each of them want to accomplish, whether they're movies or TV shows. And how could they have managed to build him an entire statue in his honor in the span of two days? There was a museum and big statue and everything at the end. It was great. I'm usually pretty lenient when it comes to plot holes, but this is a textbook example of how no thought was put into where this film fits in the timeline. I could keep going about this movie not being funny in general, but I don't really see a point. The style of humor, voice acting, and animation are things that I, and you probably, correctly presumed would be bad going in, and those first two really are outside of the studio's control. It just doesn't seem fair to levy criticism at the animators, so I have no doubt did their best with what was given to them. And with DreamWorks being in a lot of financial trouble lately, I don't want to place too much emphasis on that aspect. It's not like bad animation alone is enough to ruin a piece of media for me, even by modern standards. Yes, the experience is generally made worse by those things, but none of them are really what soured this particular experience for me the most. Nor was it the thing that made me realize that Megamind should not have been turned into a franchise. That being said, it is pretty depressing that they used footage from the original side by side with this. When done well, villain protagonists can be one of the most interesting character tropes in all of fiction, and Megamind is no exception. The superhero genre very rarely tells stories through the lens of their villains, since oftentimes they're the ones that we're rooting against. But it works well in Megamind's case, since even though he functionally fills the role of a villain in the story, he isn't the antagonist, and he has a traditional hero that he has to fight against, as opposed to it being a story that follows a bunch of villains' interactions with each other. There are a lot of sympathetic elements to his character, character that make you root for his journey as he becomes a hero and learns to accept himself. It really is one of the most unique setups for this concept that I haven't seen any other piece of media replicate. Unfortunately, a lot of that is non-existent here. The film opens with Megamind and Minion doing hero work, he's given the keys to the city after saving the day, and Minion rightfully wants to be considered an equal alongside him. Minion, the one person who's been by his side all throughout his highs and lows. I mean, you'd kind of think this wouldn't even be a conflict in the first place, but for some reason the writers decided they wanted to give Megamind a very I work alone mentality. Chum wants a promotion. He wants to be your sidekick. Sidekick? 
<laughs> That's a big change. So much so, he decides he'd rather let Minion quit than give him a promotion. And then explicitly says it's a manipulation tactic for Minion to come crawling back to him later. Relax, it's a negotiation tactic. Like the time he went on a hunger strike because he wanted a pet parakeet. <sighs> There is so much to unpack with why this character arc doesn't work. First and foremost, the fact that Megamind is completely unjustified in treating him this way given their dynamic in the first movie. Minion was essentially his only friend throughout that film, even though he was enabling him to continue to be a villain. Once again, the sidekick thing is very heavily implied, so this shouldn't be something that's up for debate. The concept of characters wanting to go solo is for egotists at the top of their game, not people who just came out of rock bottom. And hey, I guess this means Megamind is finally living up to his name. Okay, that's that's a little bit mean. Let's just assume in good faith that Megamind's fame as the defender of Metro City has made him a bit of an egotist, even though that is highly doubtful given he's only been accepted by society for two days. He likes all the attention now that he finally has it. This arc still falls apart once we find out about his history with the Doom Syndicate. Not only do we find out that he has pre-established connections with them, but that he was the founding member and willfully left them behind just because he didn't like sharing the spotlight. Light, implying that he's always been like this ever since he became a villain, which is 100% wrong. I don't really want to call it character assassination, but it definitely feels like the writers took the wrong idea from the original when making this movie. Megamind loves himself a lot? Well, we've got to make sure that carries over to the sequel. But with him, the egocentricity never stemmed from getting attention. It was his own individual skill sets and unique inventions that gave him confidence in being bad. And one of the most sympathetic aspects of his character was his loneliness. That he wasn't able to connect with other people because they thought he was weird for being good at those things. He was pressured into villainy despite being good at heart. When Tom McGrath, the director of the original film, and also the voice of Skipper, fun fact, was asked in an interview about Megamind's relationship with Roxanne Ritchie, he responded with the following. Yeah, that was the biggest, hardest thing to pull off, and the thing you worry about when you go home at night. But the thing about it is there's a stage presence to Megamind, where he's big and powerful, but that there's a guy behind the mask because it's the story of a guy who wants to just fit in and be considered normal. So in some way, there's a little Phantom of the Opera and Beauty and the Beast. And that's what she's drawn to, the side of him that's beneath that mask. Now there is a way I do believe Megamind wanting to fight crime alone could work in theory. All you have to do is make it so that he's motivated by fear instead of egotism. He isn't the best when it comes to social interactions, and he points out that everything that's come with his transition is happening very fast. It would make sense that he wouldn't want to lose the people that brought out the best in him as much as they want to help. And having him push them away and pretend to be bad to keep them out of harm's way from the Doom Syndicate would have been a better direction to take the story. As written though, all of his actions are rooted in arrogance and the quirks that make him entertaining diminish his credibility a little bit. If there was any indicator that the screenwriters had no understanding of Megamind's appeal, it's present in one of the worst scripts I've ever seen in any mainstream animated film. Just take a look at the Doom Syndicate themselves. The justification for their absence is that they were waiting for Megamind to take over the city before breaking out of prison, like he does in the first movie. I already disliked the idea of Megamind having a team while he was a villain, but adding this completely unnecessary explanation for why they never show up until now, even even if it does make sense for Megamind not to tell Roxanne about them, it makes them infinitely less threatening and is made worse by the fact that they all exist to be comic relief characters, who, and I think this should go without saying, are not funny. Not to mention getting the flimsiest form of backstory for the nature of their relationship. Because the thing is, you really need a good excuse if you're going to put the city in mortal danger because of these guys. And to clarify, when I say Megamind being motivated by fear would be an interesting idea, I meant with how being a hero impacts his friends. Because there really is no way Megamind would do something like this out of cowardice for another villain. That's the motivation Roxanne gives him when she's captured by Titan. She says that it was his best quality and it's what justified him not being the most competent supervillain out there. Now he's just incompetent and airheaded which is a horrible, horrible combination. Yeah! 
So now most of this movie is Megamind weaseling his way out of actually doing anything evil. If anything, the fact that the Doom Syndicate believe him at all show how they're even more incompetent. Roxanne doesn't have anything to do here outside of holding Megamind's hand throughout the whole situation, and one scene where she talks about feeling underappreciated as a journalist, which doesn't make sense. Megamind's character shift is probably worse from a screenwriting standpoint, but I think I'm more annoyed at the handling of Roxanne Ritchie. She's the most well-written love interest in any DreamWorks movie, and my personal favorite that's actually canon. And that's because she never felt limited to the role of Megamind's girlfriend like she is in this movie. Because her conflict is never getting any focus outside of this one scene. There's this kid who's Megamind's unofficial campaign manager who just shows up when the writers can't come up with a good excuse for a scenario Megamind put himself into. I have to rob a bank with my friends! Oh, don't worry, we'll just pretend to rob you for social media posts to explain what to do when you're being robbed. Minion has a subplot about going to work at the restaurant once he quits working for Megamind. And as disconnected as it is from the main plot and not the most entertaining thing in the world, I at least felt happy that he's at a place where he can finally be appreciated. Initially, I was going to cite it as one of the only saving graces of this movie. But then, after he's found a place where he's able to utilize his skills and get recognized for it by his new boss, Megamind has to come back to him after the Doom Syndicate wiped the floor with him. He sees how happy that Minion is here, though, and decides to let him stay, before they retcon it because he feels guilty for the mess that he dug himself into. So essentially, it's the movie's way of completely absolving him of any and all responsibility he had putting himself in a position that was completely avoidable, and doesn't even have him apologize to either of them for putting them in this position. It's doubling down on Megamind's toxic sentiments that Minion will come back on his own, saying that it's okay for him to treat the people who cared about him before he was famous this way because he's just that cool. Fuck everything about this movie. So they find out he's lying, Megamind learns the same lesson that he did in the first film, they fight off the villains, the action is bad, Roxanne becomes the mayor of Metro City out of nowhere, there's a post credit scene where Megamind's one-time mentioned mentor shows up to break everyone out, they'll probably fight him in the TV show, whatever, I don't care, the end. So I know a very good number of you watching are probably thinking like, yeah, well, like, but it's like it's a direct-to-video sequel, it's not good, but like we can all just like ignore it. And that's true. I genuinely don't want to ever think about this movie again. But there is one more thing that I wanted to bring up. There are two types of sequels that I believe exist. The ones where you come back for the characters, and the ones where you come back for the stories of those characters, both internal and external. It does feel like the former is becoming more and more common, but DreamWorks is very much capable of recognizing when a movie has room for expansion into an ongoing story across installments, where there's room for continued exploration of the world and lore, giving us answers to the unorthodox. If I were to describe my feelings on Megamind versus the Doom Syndicate in one sentence, it would be this. Every form of added backstory, world building, and characterization diminishes the emotional value of the original in some way. And a lot of that stems from how complete the original film's narrative feels. I've cited the time gap between these two movies a lot throughout this, but the direction they chose to take everybody, most of which are compelling stories in isolation, are confined by what the original film was trying to say and do irrespective of that. The weakest franchises are the ones unwilling to acknowledge when a story has reached its natural endpoint, and sometimes that can be the first movie. It's fine to want more of your favorite characters, but sometimes it's important to recognize when their emotional journey peaks. I think it'd be wrong not to include Despicable Me in this conversation to explain what I mean. An animated film that had very similar circumstances as Megamind happened to come out at the right time and ended up kickstarting one of the most financially lucrative franchises in film history. People thought that it was unjustified that this was the more successful of the two, and Megamind should have been the one that stayed prevalent in pop culture. But I found a really good piece comparing the two written in 2020, 10 years after they were both released. Overall, the answer to the question of which is best depends on how you frame it. Despicable Me was more commercially successful and the brand has had greater staying power. Yet Megamind was more precedent when it comes to the evolution of the superhero genre over the last 10 years and it might even be more timely in 2020 than when it first came out. So in that sense, it's Megamind that gets the last laugh in this unexpected battle of supervillain cartoons. I'm aware that DreamWorks does have plans to potentially make a third theatrically released film, but it makes me wonder, is there a good direction that can add to the original 
original satisfying story, because I'd still very much be content with letting one of DreamWorks' most underrated films lay rest as opposed to trying to capitalize on its newfound popularity. Sometimes good can be found in a piece of media not having the highest box office or being integral to mainstream pop culture, and we shouldn't use that as our metric for success. I absolutely would have loved both those things for Megaminds, but there's always a cost to that. I don't know what the future for our blue-headed friend is yet, but at the end of the day, it's always there for us. Dependable. Perhaps we took its ultimate outcome for granted. We never know how good we have it until it's gone.